life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello. Hello. I am Lanny. I'm Marshall. And Corey is taking a little break from this episode. It'll be just the two of us. Today we're going to talk about Season 2, Episode 1, What Lies Ahead. What Lies Ahead is a lot of crying, a lot of pain, a lot of torment, and occasionally some happy moments with families. So a little about this episode before we jump into what happens. What Lies Ahead was the last episode written by Frank Darabont, who had been fired from the show in July 2011. Well, that's just sad. Um, it was directed by Gwyneth Horder Payton and Ernest Dickerson. Before its first airing, several segments were announced and broadcast, including a six-part internet series and a live after show hosted by Chris Hardwick, which we know is called The Talking Dead. And it's kind of the prototype of what we're doing here, only we're doing it with a much larger view. Correct. Also, I did watch the six-part internet series. Um, I, I've purchased the DVDs uh, so that I could watch all the bonus features and commentaries and whatnot. And the six-part internet series is boring. Red pill me on this. What's going on in this six-part series? Uh, well, it's about this it, completely different characters. There's, like, no characters that are crossover. And I think this woman, like crashes her car into a tree and her kids are gone and she finds her kids at her ex-husband's house and then it's just all this other drama about them <laughs> so it was just kind of like all right I, I don't even think i need to go into it that much more because no yeah if you want to see it you can find it online as well as on the dvds what Lies Ahead was first broadcast in the united states on october 16th 2011 on amc it received 7.3 million views in its first showing, breaking the record for the most watched drama in the history of cable television, which if you remember from episode six, their first watch viewership was 5.9. So now they're at 7.3. Total viewership after two encore presentations was 11 million views. That's crazy and as we know people probably watched it a few times so uh the other reason why there was so much is because it was 11 months between season one and season two so the hype there was a lot of hype being spread also comic-con yeah comic-con when it was in 2011 was huge huge that year and a lot of people were super hyped already from the first season. So that just served to hype it a little bit more. This episode also won the Primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Prosthetic Makeup for a series, miniseries, movie, or special at the 64th Primetime Creative Arts Emmy Awards in 2012. But it was the second win for this series after Greg Nicotero and his team were awarded for the series premiere of Days Gone By as well. So it looks like the first episode in both season one and season two, they won. Yeah, the, the prosthetic makeups they do in this show are kind of nuts. They really push the boundaries of what you can and can't do with prosthetics and other kinds of special effects and blood squirting. What's really cool also is that in the season two DVDs, there are quite a few things that I watched regarding their makeup and their prosthetic. And one of the things uh, that I watched was his like neighbor or nephew, I can't remember who it was, Greg Nicoteros, wanted to be a zombie for Halloween. So they showed how you can make zombie makeup with just stuff from around your house. Um, it was like gelatin and like some spackle stuff and how you use different makeup to just make it look like you've been a zombie. And it was fascinating. I thought it was so fun. So we'll talk about some other things that happened in this se season that they did their prosthetics on, including the well zombie, which is Ooh. coming up um, this season as well. Uh, so most of the principal photography for What Lies Ahead took place in unincorporated Henry County, Georgia, 
on June 5th through the 9th in 2011, using a stretch of Georgia State Route 20 that was closed to traffic for the purpose. I do have a lot more about that later on when we get to that point because I listened to the commentary on that part, and Gail Hurd, who is one of the producers, uh, talked a lot about what they did uh, for that, that whole scene. Originally supposed to be an extended 90-minute premiere and included a prequel episode that was called Miles Behind Us. Many parts were cut, including where Rick and the group go back to where the Vatos are are, and find them dead. The deleted scenes appear on the Season 2 DVD, and Kirkman says only about 15 minutes of the original episode appears in the final cut, which explains why this episode is one hour instead of 40 to 45 minutes. So I did go in and watch the deleted scenes, and this is what happens. So in one deleted scene, Shane's uh, car breaks down. Remember, he's in a Jeep, and he hops into the RV. So... At that point, uh, that's why you'll see later on there is no more Jeep in their caravan. Then they decide they're going to go to the nursing home. And at the nursing home, uh, everyone is gunned down and the place is overrun with zombies. So what happens in this scene um, that I can describe, which I think is just is the cutest thing, is the first thing that happens is uh, there's a scene in the hallway where I think it's like Carol, Lori, and Carl... And Sophia are hiding from zombies that are on the other side of a door outside. And Sophia is about to freak out and Carl kind of reaches over and takes her hand and like says, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So in the comic book, Carl and Sophia develop this really amazing friendship, uh, almost a relationship, I think. I'm not to that part yet, so that might happen. But I think this was just a point to show that what happens before Sophia disappears in the show. Because in the comic, she doesn't disappear. Mm -hmm. So this whole thing I just thought was so cute. And then there's another scene where they're in this big room and Daryl makes an observation that everyone has that walkers did not kill these people they were shot and andrea makes some flippant comment like oh how did you observe that with your smart brain and daryl says observant if you look at their heads they are all shot execution style bullet hole in the head i am observant and I was like, you go, Daryl. Like, thank you for breaking that stereotype of the fact that you are not just some, like, redneck idiot. You're not. He's actually very smart. He's a tracker, which means he sees little details very well. And he translates them into what, what the physics of that means. So he can find things. And so, yeah, he'll notice, yeah, these things were shot in the head. So those were the, the important things I got from the deleted scenes. So... Oh, there you go. Uh, I believe helpful. that you can you can probably find these online somewhere, but I couldn't find them on the YouTube channel. That being said, let's jump straight into the episode. Now, I'm going to be very upfront with you. This episode, a lot of it took place in Atlanta, but then you go to the street, and then you go to the forest, and all of these places have things in the background galore. Yeah. And we're going to talk about them, because... <laughs> Even in the first part before the opening credits, it took me at least 45 minutes just to go through everything. So here we go. We're going to start with the empty streets of Atlanta. There's some dogs eating a zombie walker, it looks like, or a person. I can't really tell. Which makes me ask one question, though. We have not really seen zombie animals. No. Which means whatever the zombie thing is, it only works on people. So Rick is talking to Morgan on the roof of Grady Memorial Hospital. So Grady Memorial was a major location in uh, season five of The Walking Dead, but it also appears in this episode uh, when Rick is on the walkie trying to communicate with Morgan. Maybe he's not on the roof. Maybe it's in the outside. Anyway, whatever it is, he's in or yeah, around Grady Memorial. you can Grady see Memorial. it behind him. Oh, it's behind him. Right, right, right. Yeah. Grady Memorial is located on Piedmont Avenue, about halfway distance between the Pipe Corner, where we saw that antique sign, and we talked about that in, I think, episode four yes. of season one, and there's also a Baptist church. So that's in the next scene. There's zombies that are kind of like in the yard, like, Arr. 
and you see the sign says Wheat Street Baptist Church. The so Wheat Street Baptist Church is a historic black Baptist church located in the Sweet Auburn neighborhood of Atlanta, Georgia. It was founded in 1869. The current building was constructed in 1921 and is located adjacent to the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historical Park. So we talked about the Pipe Corner and how it's located on Walton and Forsyth. This church is 20 minutes away, walking distance away okay. from Forsyth. And then you take a ride on Auburn. So it, it doesn't take very long to get there from where they were. Uh, over on where the pipe corner was. So I find it very interesting that they went from the CDC and it seems like they, they rallied at this church that was not that far away. This is probably immediate, like, this is immediately after that deleted scene of the Vatos mm -hmm. because that's not that far away. Correct. That's yeah. that's what I thought, think, thought about too. Then there's this scene where as rick is talking these zombies are like eating something outside this building with a big sign that says keep out and this is the hurt building which is an eight minute walk from grady memorial so the hurt building is an 18 story building located at 50 hurt plaza in atlanta georgia and it has this unique triangular shape uh, one of the nation's earliest skyscrapers, the Hurt Building, was built between 1913 and 1926 and was the initial home for the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. It was renovated in 1985 and currently they are doing a $4 million lobby renovation and there is also a Starbucks in the lobby of oh, this building. Okay, so here we are. We are not this far from the Hurt Building with a Starbucks in the lobby and for those survivors out there, the coffee beans are probably still good. Uh, as long as they haven't been ground, they will be good for up to 34 days. And we know that it's been just a little under a month, little somewhere around a month mm -hmm. since the apocalypse began. And the flavor syrups that they have in there will be good for uh, probably, probably more like two to four months after this point. Gotcha. So as long as they don't grind anything... They can have coffee for a little while. So one last location note here in Atlanta. If you were to walk from where the lab slash department store was on Walton and go to where the Vatos were, which was in the Goats Arts yeah. building, I can't remember what it's called, it would take an hour on foot. So when they go to the Vatos and say, we want Glenn, and then go back to the lab, that's one hour to get there, one hour to get back, and then one more hour to take the guns to the Vatos. You're talking three hours. It's giving giving the Vatos time to stew with what they're saying. I but would also, find a vehicle. <laughs> but also, yeah, like I, if I'm trying to keep guns from somebody, I would want to hide it somewhere where it's going to take them a while to get to it. So Rick says to Morgan that they're going to go to Fort Benning. So he says it's 125 miles. But from Grady Memorial, it's only 116 miles from Google Maps and will take an hour and 46 minutes by car if you go straight shot from Grady to Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to see a montage of them going to the cars. Notice there's only three cars now. There's the RV, then Carol's SUV, which is the same people as before, and Daryl's bike. So obviously the truck has now been ditched also. Also the van has been ditched. So <laughs> we're down to only three vehicles. It's fine though, because the RV can fit a lot of people. Yeah, so the Jeep got ditched because it broke down and more than likely they ditched Daryl's truck because it was using up too much fuel. Mm -hmm. And they needed all the fuel they could get for the RV. Right. Also, I would like to note that as I'm watching Daryl on this bike, those type of bikes with the handles that are really high would hurt my arms. I think my arms would fall asleep on this on this bike. <laughs> but we have also found out that this bike does belong to Daryl's brother. Mm. Find this okay. out later. That would actually explain all of the the imagery that we find on there because the, on there is a SS symbol, you know, from Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. Makes sense that Merle would be a neon. Right, for sure. So as the cars are driving down the highway, I'm going to tell you who is in each vehicle. So we have Daryl on his bike. We have the same people in, the, in Carol's SUV, Rick, Lori, 
Carol, Sophia, and Carl. And in the RV, we have Dale, Glenn, Andrea, Shane, and T-Dog because we no longer have Jackie. When they're in the SUV, Rick and uh, everyone in there have this whole conversation about where should they go? And then they talk about Grand Canyon. And um, Rick says to Sophia and Carol that they won't go anywhere without the two of them because they're like family now. And I thought that was such a really nice moment that they've gone through all of these things. Even though Carol and Sophia had to distance themselves from the rest of the group because of Ed, they still are included and they're still welcomed and part of the family in that way. Yeah. And I'd say at this point, like, they look at everybody, and I think it's pretty much just Andrea and Shane, although from Dale's perspective, this is a little different. It feels like everybody but Andrea and Shane are part of the family now. Right. Um, Where Andrea is just being kind of the whiny little sister, and Shane is the creepy uncle. (laughs) Although in the RV, Shane is teaching Andrea how to clean a gun. Yes. Now, this is actually a very important first step. When we think about gun safety, we oftentimes just sit there and think about somebody at a shooting range teaching you how to be safe with it. But probably the best first step with gun safety is to have somebody disassemble, reassemble, and clean a gun. Mm -hmm. They now understand all the inner workings of it. So when they start shooting that gun, they're not surprised by anything that happens. They also know how these gun actions are working so they can think about it ahead of time. But there's another little bit to this. When Shane looks at her gun, I get a couple brief glimpses and I'm like, okay, great. What kind of gun is this? Because he points out that it's a really nice piece. From what I can tell looking at it, this is what is called an MAS 1935S. Uh, I say MAS because the actual name of it is in French and I I I don't pronounce that very well. Uh, This gun first entered service for the French military just before World War II. Yet again, another World War II reference in this show. It is an eight-round magazine, so when Shane says that this has a seven-round limit, that's not too far off. It is a historical pistol, so finding ammo is going to be very special because the ammo went out of production in 1960 and only started to get made again in 2019. So when the show is going on, she is not ever going to find ammunition for this thing. The seven shots that she has in this gun is all she's ever going to get. And I think she spends them later on. I think so too. So we're going to keep an eye on that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to keep an account of her shots. So one interesting thing about this whole scene is I'm finally able to see what are on the walls of the RV. Yeah. And the first thing I noticed is the sign says, how about a nice cup of shut the hell up? Loving it. Loving <laughs> it. That does sound like Daryl. Right. Not Daryl. Like, uh, like Dale. Dale. But what's really funny is later on I'm going to tell you what the sign on the other side of Andrea's head says because it's like a total oxymoron with this sign. So we'll we'll talk about that later. The signs in this thing is just hilarious. So they come up to a huge traffic accident blocking the road. There are cars upside down and I do want to make a point of this. This is not just something that happened that people got congested on their way out of the city. This is a major traffic accident and it is a point that needs to be made to explain something else later. So the first thing is they have to find their way through this because they can't go to the backtrack and circle around on another freeway because they will burn up a lot of fuel that way. So they need to find a way through. As they are, they see dead people in the cars. And so one of the points that was made on the commentary was that one of the first questions they get about the scene is why are there dead people in the cars? Why aren't there zombies? And and instead... And they said this is how they explained it. So if if a person died in such a way, like during the car accident, that their brain is damaged, then they don't become a zombie. They just die. Mm-hmm. So what they're saying is the car wreck may have caused their death. And therefore, they are not zombies in the car. They're just dead people. 
which would kind of make sense because what it looks like happened in this is that that tr that gas trailer the the big truck overturned while trying to dodge something and now everybody's ramming into each other trying to dodge each other and they're all whacking their own heads on their steering wheels and dying right uh sometimes there are some people in the back seat though so sometimes sometimes i mean, I mean <laughs> the, there's no easy answer but that's that's my best guess as to what's going on here mm. the rv blows its radiator hose again again so i found two continuity catches in this scene the first one is when they all come out of the rv there is now an l in the word dale on the side of the rv whereas before in the scene where amy gets bit there is no l in the word dale Mm -hmm. So there is no way for them to get another L back there. So I don't know why they did that. <laughs> yeah, I don't get it either. It may have yeah. been that it fell off in the previous scenes and nobody caught it in mm. continuity. And they just left it. Right. Well, it's it's the complete opposite way. No, I mean, like, in, in the previous episode, they had... Like, it's supposed to just be stickered on. They could remove it. Right. But somebody forgot to put it back on before the shot. So they did it for this season instead. Yeah. Gotcha. So the other continuity catch was that when they leave the CDC, there's a green canoe on the top of the RV. I actually went back and watched it during not just the episode, but I made sure during some of the scenes they show you in the deleted scenes and whatever, the canoe is still on that RV. But when they break down here there is no canoe do we see the canoe ever again no so it may have been that they ditched it when they were at the church uh this is before that no i mean the the church in, oh with the vatos no they had it there in the deleted scenes when they're leaving it's still on there mm, there you go so the, it, they just forgot about it once mm -hmm. they got on the road correct so then they decide to look for gas fuel, water, other items, and a new radiator hose so they all get out. Dale teaches Glenn how to change the hose. I think this is so great because Dale really takes this instinct to teach people no matter who he's encountering. He's always like trying to teach people and help mentor them and I think that's great. I don't think they respect him enough for this honestly. No they don't. I mean it's best if the entire team can do things. Y yeah specialization really does help because it keeps people from overloading but when everybody can do can do some of the most important things excellent. So a couple other things I noticed in this scene was that there is a backpack on the ground that says Alexis. Probably some child's backpack. It's Alexis Rose's backpack. Right. Ew, David. <laughs> um, name The name on the top back of Dale's Winnebago says Pillbox. I think that's just, I don't know if it's a type of their, their well, um, RV or what. In World War II, a pillbox was the place where snipers would hide in from the top, like, it's basically a dugout with a covering. And oh. that's where snipers would be. And that's what Dale does from there. That he sits is. there with his gun and he shoots at zombies. Very good. Andrea goes back to cleaning her gun. And now I would like to talk about the other sign on the other side of her head. It is a poem called The Miracle of Friendship. And this is what it says. There is a miracle called friendship that dwells within the heart. And you don't know how it happens or even when it starts. But the happiness it brings you always gives a special lift. And you realize that friendship is God's most precious gift. How about a nice cup? Shut the... <laughs> Actually, I think this is very indicative of Dale and his wife. Because I can tell you which one of those signs was from Dale and which one was from his wife. <laughs> I had the same thought. <laughs> <laughs> and they both put their signs up and they're like... Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then Shane finds a large truck of bottled water. And they're, they're like the gigantic bottles of water. And he proceeds to open one up and just dump it on himself. Not, hey, let's go find other containers and fill this. No. Shower time. We actually see them do that later. In the background, like two people are talking about something or other. I think it's actually Shane and Lori that are talking about something. And you can see T-Dog in the background taking one of the giant bottles of water and using it to fill smaller containers, other plastic containers okay, that they good. had emptied. 
But still, he wastes an entire bottle of water on taking an impromptu shower. Yes. I would like to talk about this water. So the name on the truck says Lipsy Spring Water. I did a very deep dive into what Lipsy Spring Water is. It is an actual company that is in the Atlanta area, was founded more than 30 years ago by Joe Lipsy Jr. And what I mean by 30 years ago is 30 years ago from today, not from when this was shot. Mm-hmm. Um, it was So it was founded by Joe Lipsy Jr. and his son, Joe the Third. The water delivery company was the first and remains the only premium glass bottled water company in the metro Atlanta area. So here's something they say. At Lipsy, we deliberately keep our delivery area limited to the Atlanta area because we feel that keeping our delivery area small allows us to provide more personalized service. And from your research, they only deliver in glass bottles. Correct. And that was a plastic sound when he took that lid That off. is what I noticed. When he opens it, on the top of it, it does this punk, which sounds exactly like what the plastic bottle would sound like so i don't think those are glass bottles in that truck yeah they probably got the truck decorated it and it was actually like an aquafina truck or something yeah a coca-cola water truck right but it was nice that they did have this company that really was local to atlanta Mm -hmm. on here like that's a detail that i probably would be like oh let's just get arrowhead or whatever you know yeah and the people in atlanta are like that's awesome i've seen those trucks right yeah really awesome i think this is really going to show how much that this crew made themselves are making themselves a home in the atlanta area there's so much in atlanta that you can go and see even today with the walking dead from uh places they filmed to restaurants and stores that have to do with this place that they really made themselves home in this area. So at that point, Rick and Dale both spot the herd of walkers coming at them. So a little bit about what I found out about this herd. So what they did was they had between 100 and 150 extras and they arrived at 3 a.m. in the morning for a 7 a.m. call time. So it took them four hours to all get them through for their makeup before they started filming. Sometimes when they were filming, they had to actually clear the highway and then reposition the cars back in the same place depending on how their filming was for that day. So someone literally had to sit there and say, no, that car goes there and this car goes here and it has to be positioned like this. So there is somebody with a map of the cars Probably pictures as well, yes. Yeah. Uh, So they all get out underneath the vehicles. Dale is on top of the RV. And then Andrea is like in the RV cleaning her gun, not even noticing what's happening. And then she looks out the window and she's like, oh, oh. This okay. is not good. So she tries to start getting into the bathroom. So a lot of things are happening all at once here. T-Dog tries to hide by a car and ends up rip like getting a big rip in his arm. Like it's a chunk of one of the windows of the car. And oh, it just it's something rips like or, or something so sticking bad. out like a nail or yeah. Then we go back into the RV and this walker goes into the RV after Andrea. This is what I want to talk about when we talk about separating human behavior from the animal behavior of a walker. I fully believe that walkers can hear and smell and they can go after you based on that. But if you watch this walker, he's not going on smell. He's looking. He is calculated searching. Watch his eyes. He's like, I'm walking down here and I'm looking around in the bedroom and I'm looking around in the bedroom and then I'm looking up above and then I'm looking down below and I'm looking at the door and then I'm turning around. That guy wasn't sniffing. He wasn't just like, or else he would have been able to smell her on the other side of the door, which he did not. Yeah. So that, again, that kind of goes back to what we were saying in the previous episode, that how long it took them to die may actually affect how smart they are. Right. Yeah. If they're the more dumb zombies, then they rely more on their sense of smell because their olfactory senses are stronger being more crocodile-brained. I am literally throwing out Trechnobabble. 
About this point, Andrea makes a noise and, the, and he comes back. He's like halfway out of the RV and he hears it. And he's like, ah. Yeah, she drops parts of the gun that she's... Right, so he comes there. back. Okay, I totally get that. You hear the noise, you go. But there's a part of me that suspects he wouldn't have even made it into the RV in the first place. Because it's up high, you have to like get up and step into it, which means you have to use your brain and be like, oh, I must use these mannerisms in order to get there. It's not usually like the zombie goes in and goes, the shuffle. Ah, you know? They go down. They don't usually go up. <laughs> that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he comes back, and Dale's up on the roof, opens the door because he hears her screaming, and drops the screwdriver down to her. And she proceeds to not only stab this walker in the eye, but, like, stab multiple times because she's had it. Like, she, she is just, like, she's freaking. She's done with being afraid. I think that's what it is. Right now, she is done with being afraid. Yes, she, she really is. So that is, uh, I think she's starting to come out of her little trauma there just a little bit. Daryl has is seeing what's happening. So he comes running out and he starts stabbing walkers, gets T-Dog on the ground, grabs a walker and puts it on top of him and then grabs another one and puts it on top of, of himself to shield them from the herd going by. This is a lot like the guts from episode two. Mm -hmm. They're using the dead to mask their scents, and Mm -hmm. then they are freezing so that any noise, any uh, visual cues that they are alive and moving are gone. Mm -hmm. Also, I would like to bring up that finally Daryl is the one who has something to stab things with because everyone else has been like, you're going to use my gun or I don't have anything to stab with or whatever. And along comes Daryl and he's like, stab, 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 stab. This is how you do it, guys. I feel like at this point they should have been prepared. They should know that this is how you do it. You know, it. I, I would say after a month, two months, however long it's been right now, they need to know. They should know that it, this is yeah. SOP. A- a- everybody has a, a stabity tool. You know, it doesn't need a whole lot. You can have an ice pick. It'll be fine. Exactly. You might not have enough power to actually get through the skull, but you should have something. Mm -hmm. So the herd starts going by, and everyone thinks they're kind of safe. And then Sophia starts to make her way out from under the car and notices a straggler goes after her. So she rolls out the other way and down the embankment, which causes two walkers to go after her. So then Rick, of course, being who Rick is, jumps out and runs after the other two walkers. Here is a good point to note that Sophia is running with the doll that she got from the Morales' daughter. Mm -hmm. So that's where that is coming back in as well. Carol is crying. There's two walkers after my daughter. Rick finally catches up to Sophia near a tree. But instead of having something to stabity on his leather belt full of notches, uh, little pouches, and ways to hang things, he does not. No. And cannot kill the zombies. He is actually wearing his uh, standard duty belt. This is a a standard thing that most police officers will wear, and they will have a spot for their gun, their handcuffs, a flashlight, baton, pepper spray, um, and then a few uh, some extra ammo. But mm-hmm. it seems like all he has on it is his gun, the spot for his handcuffs, and a bunch of empty pockets. I feel like he should have some kind of Swiss Army knife or multi-tool in one of those things. Why does he not have this? I'm What I'm figuring he did is he swapped out everything for, in those pockets would be like speed loaders for his Colt Python. Because Colt Pythons have lots of ammo available all over the place. And he knows he's going to need more ammo for I his still gun. call foul. I still call foul. <laughs> he should have something. Yeah. At least a Leatherman. Right. So instead, he decides he's going to leave Sophia by a tree under this, like, overhang of the roots so that she's hidden and he can lead the walkers off. Though, though what's really interesting about this is that there is a connection here. If you remember Henry, when Henry arrives, uh, I think it's in, like... Uh, season eight? Yeah. And Carol finds Henry. It's by a tree. So here we see Sophia by a tree and Henry was by a tree. And Carol is the link between them. But there is one more link. And that is that the kid who plays Henry is played by Mason Lentz. 
And his older sister, Madison, is the one who's playing Sophia. So there is, Mm -hmm. like, a real-life connection there as well, which I thought was very interesting. So, like we said, Rick hides Sophia under the tree roots, and he goes running off and tries to lead them away from Sophia. I find it really interesting. Like, if you watch these walkers, though, one of them stumbles around. He just kind of falls off the embankment, um, just completely stumbles off. But the other one comes up to the edge of the embankment and watches Rick, and he's kind of bouncing around all jittery-like, um, kind of like some sort of woodsman, like Daryl would be if he got if he was in a bad situation. Mm-hmm. That's how he was acting. So he actually has some personality as a zombie. So this is, again, another smart zombie, I think. Because he did not go off the embankment. Right. He went around. So Rick ends up killing them with with a big stone that he finds. And his face, (laughs) when he's killing the second one, is just like, die, zombie, die. There is a deleted scene in here where Rick goes back to see uh, the camp to where their, their RV is. After he has left Sophia. Because when he goes, he notices that Sophia is no longer there. So he goes back to the camp expecting to see Sophia there. And at the same time that he realizes Sophia isn't there, he notices Carol. And Carol notices him without Sophia and she's breaking down. And it's it's only like a two second scene, but it's a really interesting moment between both of them just realizing at the same time what's really going on. So then it kind of feeds into this scene where Rick takes Daryl, Shane, and Glenn to go look for Sophia. And they know, you know, they know she's not under the tree anymore, but but Daryl is a tracker. So he is following the prints of her and where she went. So at a certain point, she veers off in a different direction than where the RV trail is. So Shane and Glenn go back to the cars, and Daryl and Rick continue to look for Sophia. So back at the highway, they're clearing the cars to make room to go through, and Carol is questioning as to why they aren't all going to look for Sophia, and Shane's like, no, 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 we're just going to keep scavenging, they'll come back, which I think is a good move, really, because you don't want all these people looking all at once. Because eventually someone's going to get bit or lost out there, and now you're looking for two people. They do cut back to the forest where they're still looking, but then... On the highway side of it, Carl finds a roll of, like, weapons in this truck and, like, climbs into the truck and gets these things. There's, like, a hatchet and, like, a machete and a bunch of other things in this It's a bunch of Gerber machetes Mm -hmm. and axes for survival tools. Which is is great because these are exactly what you need to... (laughs) <laughs> do headshots and kill these things. So he ends up bringing them to Shane. Shane basically is like, that's nice. <laughs> Go give it to Dale. Off. Yeah. And so Lori's like, why did you brush him off like that? And so they have this whole disagreement um, because she doesn't think that Shane should brush him off. But Shane is like, well, you told me to stay away from him. Which, I mean, it's a valid point, really. But... I get what she's saying. I do get what she's saying. But at the same time, I think she's being very wishy-washy about this situation. But also, Shane is being delusional because he doesn't really admit or recognize the extent of what he did to her at the CDC. Yeah, he's just like, well, it was a mistake. You know, I think we all kind of agree that it was a mistake. Well, yes, but, you know, so is being anywhere near you, so... Right. And he even said, I think mistakes were made on both sides and she was like i'm not saying they weren't in fact i totally admit that there were mistakes made on both sides you know Mm -hmm. um i get this this is a very complicated situation i think they're both not behaving the way that they should be behaving but at the same time they both kind of have a point so shane reveals that he is leaving which honestly might be the first selfless thing i've heard him say lately yeah and if they would just let him leave i think this would have been a very different story. He's getting kind of a junker car. That's what he's pre- prepping up as his new ride. Right. And if he's this guy that, you know, is planning on going on his own, there was a super bike right next to the RV that all he had, like, it wouldn't take very much gas. Good enough for one person. The only reason he doesn't want to do it is probably because he has a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, he has a bunch of luggage, yeah. I'll say he has a bunch of luggage. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the forest. Shane and Rick are uh, 
walking around. They see a zombie meandering along. And they decide to kill him because they notice he has just eaten something. He's got some fresh blood on his face. So they decide to check his stomach contents. So they both have these gloves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, they are going to cut into that stomach. And that means that they now have blades that they didn't have before. Well, they obviously got them when Rick went back. Yeah. and they Rick realized, also... oops, I kind of need a... I, I need a stabity. A stabity. And they also got gardening gloves while they were there. Right. Which, why would you think to grab gardening gloves? That makes no sense to me. Well, they were probably thinking, okay, well, we're going to check any walker that we come across that looks like it mm. recently fed. They're probably planning to do just this to make sure, okay, right. she's not here. <laughs> Right. Oh. So this was one of the specials that I actually watched on the DVD is how they did this whole scene where they're looking into the walker's stomach. So the, what they did first was they used uh, stockings, pantyhose, and this like lots of goo and jelly to make the pantyhose look like intestines and organs, which is gross. So what they did was they made a prosthetic, like almost like a pocket, and they put all this stuff between the actual actor and the prosthetic. So that when Daryl cuts down him, that's actually the actor underneath him. But he cuts down him into the jelly and then reaches his hand in there to get all the stuff. And it looks like he goes up almost to his armpit. Like, like he's like so far yeah, in Yeah, he, he's right? going in for it, man. So what, one of the funny things, too, is that Norman Reedus was so excited about doing this scene. Like, he was so happy to get in there. Where... Whereas um, Andrew Lincoln was like, this smells so bad. Why are we doing this? This is bad, guys. I'm trying really hard, but it's <laughs> It was pretty funny. So they actually made bad smelling stuff in there so that it was authentic performance. Uh, I don't know if that's the reason why they did it, but it just smelled pretty gross. And, and it's really funny to listen to Andrew Lincoln talk about this in his British accent, his own British accent, <laughs> because he's like, Yes, it was quite disgusting. And you're like, okay. Um, it's, it's great if you have a chance to watch it. So then there's a part a little while after that where you can see straight down into the hole that they've made after taking all of the guts out. That is not the actor anymore. That's actually a dummy that they've made a hole for so that they can go straight yeah. down. But I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And, of course, they pull all this stuff out of the dummy, the walker now, and... And they figure out it looks like a woodchuck. It's not Sophia, because I see a little bitty skull, right? Yeah, they find the skull. Let's go back to the highway. It's dusk, or what I like to call the golden hour, because that's apparently the best time to take a picture. Yes. It's the golden hour, right? So Dale holds on to Andrea's gun, saying he isn't comfortable with her having it, and then Shane backs him up to say they need training. So, I would like to say that I understand what they're saying, but... I think we're really running into the fact that these men are telling Andrea what they sh they think she should be doing. And if I were Andrea, I would probably be just as ticked. Even if I was traumatic, even if I was a little erratic, I don't think it's the gun that would make me angry. It's the fact that these guys are basically telling me what to do. And I would not have that. I would be very angry. Just from me perspective, I would be because I'm stubborn like that. But come on. Come on. Um, if I was one of these guys, I'll tell you what I would do. Yeah, sure. Here's your gun. However, I'm not going to give you any bullets for it until you can disassemble and reassemble it within this amount of time. Now, she has the gun, which means something to her because it's from her father. Mm -hmm. But also, she has a goal. And that's what you need when you're trying to get past traumas and depression that is self-damaging behavior. You need control. Mm -hmm. Self-damaging behavior comes from a lack of control. Right. You make her have control and now she can move past it and she has a useful skill. Here you go. Right. And she feels much better about you because she feels like you're on your side. You're on her side. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We'll get into that a little while later because there are a couple of things that do come up about her not having a gun. But Rick and Daryl show back up without Sophia. And at that point, Carol just blames Rick for Sophia leaving and for, for Sophia not being there in the first place. 
But Rick is also kind of beating himself up a little because of the fact that he had to leave her in order to do this. I think what Rick really needs to be guilty about is the fact that he didn't bring a stabity with him all the time. Yeah. That's, that's It's not that he left her, although that was bad. It was the fact that he had to leave her because he had no knife, no axe. But what I was really paying attention to in this scene was Daryl. Mm-hmm. And the way that he's talking to Carol, and he's just got this empathetic sound, and like he he's he is hurting for her, and he cares about what she's feeling about her worry about her daughter, and he's trying to comfort her. Right. I love that. Yeah, for sure. So now they're they're saying, okay, uh, go get that roll of weapons that Carl found. We're gonna use it. Um, darn tootin'. <laughs> Rick says everyone should have a weapon. Yeah. Everyone needs to have a a weapon, for sure. So then they're going to organize a search. Dale is going to stay to repair the RV. And T-Dog is also going to stay because he is injured. So ironically, Carl wants to go. (laughs) And Dale puts his stamp of approval saying, well, what could happen with all you three there? Famous last words, Dale. Yeah. last words. I also kind of feel like he may not want carl to be there right now because you know i i think with with just dale and t-dog it might be a little much for taking care of this very energetic and wanting to be helpful boy Mm -hmm. who may get himself in trouble and neither of them are in a position to go and help him well that's a good point for sure but then dale and andrea have this whole argument about what happened at the cdc and uh, we talked a little bit about this in the last episode but uh She's dealing with the trauma of Amy, but I think she really doesn't have a handle on how valuable she is with her skills and who she is as a person. And that wanting to kill herself was like one of the most selfish things that she could do. And that she didn't understand that Dale turning the tables on her was the same as what she was doing to him. That's that's exactly it, because they're, they're both trying to make decisions for each other. Right. She's just mad that he's taking her choices from her. I mean, I kind of would be too, but I feel like she needs to get over it (laughs) at this point, right? Yeah. So now they're in the forest looking for Sophia. So Shane brushes off Carl again when they're talking and Lori's like, he's like, what the heck, dude? Which you're just kind of like, really? Yeah. We just talked about this. Uh, They find a camping area and inside there is a walker dead in a chair. With a button that says, no excuse for domestic violence. Yeah, Shane, you better recognize. What I actually notice is that here you have somebody who died in the cabin. And uh, Ed died in the cabin, who was also a domestic abuser. You mean a tent? So here you have somebody who has died in a cabin. And wow, I keep on calling it a cabin. Why do I keep calling it a cabin? This is crazy. The cabin. cabin in the woods. It's a cabin in the woods. <laughs> okay. So you have somebody who's died in a tent in the woods, totally isolated from any kind of group. Mm-hmm. And Ed also died in a tent. And this guy is saying no dom- no excuse for domestic violence, but Ed was an abuser. This is a direct callback to Ed. I love it. I love that you saw that. Daryl also finds a gun in the walker's hands. You know, score, extra gun. Also, I would like to bring out that there is an axe outside the tent. And nobody that picked it up. they don't grab. What? There wasn't an, enough in the Gerber stash to work for everybody. No. Somebody should have picked that up. Then they hear some bells ringing. So they're like, oh, let, we need to go figure out where these bells are coming from. Might be Sophia trying to signal us. But let's go back to the highway where Dale is looking off in the distance. And T-Dog's like, what's going on, dude? Shouldn't you be fixing the RV? And he's like, yeah, I fixed it yesterday. <laughs> I just don't want anybody to think that we can get moving because then somebody, Shane, would then want to just get moving. Right. Exactly. They want to make sure that there's enough time to find Sophia and that, or for her to find them. So back to the forest, they find a church where they think the bells have been ringing and there is a cemetery in the front of the church. There's also a bicycle, which I thought was fun. Uh, They probably could have used that at some point too. But anyway, this church is the Southern Baptist Church of Holy Light. That's what it says on the sign that was established in 1836. Bikers are welcome. 
And also Revelation 16, 17, which says, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Okay, so looking at this, this is one of the um, the bowls of judgment out of Revelations. And when the these bowls are done, it's like they're pouring out judgments on the people who haven't come back to God yet. Um, in the apocalypse and when this one happens there's earthquakes and it says that the great city split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed just like we're seeing here but this is also kind of looking forward because when we are in the most recent seasons the people that are we now have three main settlements. Oh, yeah, because we have Hilltop, we have Alexandria, and we have Oceanside. But that's not... And the all... kingdom, though. There's four. But the kingdom kind of falls apart. Right. And they're absorbed into the other groups. But that's not all. Because, and we're only barely beginning to see it in uh, Fear the Walking Dead, but there is a coalition of three different cities that are working together the helicopter people is what we're mm-hmm. effectively referring to them as. But they're the Republic. It's it's now been divided into three, and they're spread out all over the United States. Oh, interesting. That's a good catch also. So the real name of this church is actually Bethel United Methodist. Now, here's where it gets a little interesting to me. It's 55 minutes by car from Atlanta, and it is an hour and 30 minutes to Fort Benning. Now, if you remember correctly, when we talked before, from... Grady Memorial to Fort Benning, it was only an hour and 45 minutes. So something happened where they got very far off course because if it was kind of in the middle part, technically they would have only driven 15 minutes if they were doing a straight shot to come upon this church if it only takes an hour and 30 minutes to get to Fort Benning. Hmm. But 55 minutes to get to Atlanta that doesn't match up. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's it's uh, they got off off the straight shot right. They really must be exploring this forest really deep. Right. So this church actually does reside on two three zero five Luther Bailey Road in Sonoya, Georgia. It is permanently closed right now. Oh, a zombie church. I guess so. There are three zombies in the church though, and Rick and Shane go to kill two of the zombies. And then it's so funny because Daryl goes up to the other one and kind of gives it a little smooch. And then the zombie kind of turns and then he kills her. Now, remember when everybody was passing out weapons? There is one of them, a Gerber Gator Machete, that Glenn picked up and he's like, oh, this thing's awesome. And now we see Daryl is the one that's using it. He uses that to kill this zombie, but we never saw them pass hands. Later on, we go back outside. You still have it in Daryl's hands, but we see Glenn with it again later. Mm -hmm. So they're passing this thing between themselves, and we never see this. Which would have been totally not necessary if they had just picked up the axe from the tent. Exactly. Daryl goes up to uh, the crucifix up at the front and goes, Yo, JC, you taking requests? I thought that was hysterical. (laughs) Shane says this is not the right church because there is no... Uh, steeple, there's no bell. They realize that the ringing is actually coming from an electric timer box on the outside of the church. And that's where I noticed Glenn doesn't have the Gerber Gator there in that shot. So Andrea goes and sits around the corner. And at this point, you can notice that there is some kind of brace on her right knee. We talked in the last episode how in the shower scene and when she's in the bathroom, you can see that there is something peeking out of her capri pants when she bends her knees. And you can see it again here, but it looks very bulky. So I think something did happen to her knee at some point, and uh, she has that. But at the same time, that doesn't quite make sense to me because there's such a huge amount of time between when they filmed this and when they filmed the CDC. So in my opinion, I think she just needs extra padding in her right knee Uh, Maybe for kneeling purposes, or maybe she has an ongoing injury in her right knee. I don't know. We don't know that. It could also be a character thing. Maybe. You might want to take a look later on. If she continues to have this throughout the series, it may actually be something in her character 
that she took a knee injury. Shane and Lori talk about how he is going to leave without telling Rick and how she doesn't want him to. And then Andrea overhears this conversation. This is where she does hear their conversation that he is leaving. Um, and then we go back into the church and Carol is asking for forgiveness and speaks about how she asked for safe passage from Atlanta and deliverance from Ed and that there is a stop put to how Ed treats his daughter, um, how he looks at his daughter with what she says is sickness, yeah, which is ugh, grotesque. Um, so she thinks that Sophia n- being lost is the consequence of her asking for these things. And in this moment, I feel not only how sad it is that she feels this way, how twisted Ed made her to think that that asking for deliverance from evil gives you the consequence of more evil. Yeah. And that made me so sad. The other thing that made me kind of like go, well, is Carl's in the back. He can hear what's happening. And the look on his face when she says that she wanted Ed to stop looking at his daughter with sickness was like, what? Uh, It was amazing. Chandler did such a good job portraying that part for that one little moment um, as Carl. Because even then, we could have expected Carl to just sit there. Like, he doesn't even understand what she's talking about. But he understood it and processed it and he's now thinking about well this kind of makes sense about some things i know about sophia like that's yeah. that's in there yeah that's for really sure. cool outside andrea asks to go back with shane they have a whole conversation about that um obviously she's like i want to get out of here and i keep thinking andrea do you really think it's going to be better i mean do you just because you're away from these people she thinks that she's at least going to have freedom which is what she wants right The group heads back while Rick, Shane, and Carl continue to search the creek. Lori says, be careful, ironically. Mm -hmm. Then Daryl gives the spare gun to Lori, and Andrea gets her panties in a bunch. So (laughs) here's my thing. Because she's all like, first, Dale and Shane tell me I can't have a gun because of whatever. And now uh, Daryl is giving one to Lori. This is not fair. Blah, blah, blah. Like, and then she starts taking it out on Lori, which, in my opinion, is just wrong. What I'm, what I'm seeing here, their actual concern, the one that they listed, is that they didn't want the guns in the hands of people who weren't trained. Mm-hmm. They didn't want people that were just pop shots off because they got scared. And that's kind of where Andrea is right now. But, on the other hand, Lori is a deputy's wife. And while she might not necessarily be super proficient with a weapon, she would at least have proper handling courses. Mm -hmm. So she would know, okay, keep my finger off the trigger. Keep the safety on when I'm not intending to use it. Things like that. I would like to think that Rick gave them a gun safety course because there was a gun in the house. Yeah. Rick seems to be that type of guy, which I think we see in the first episode of the first season when he's teaching Dwayne about gun safety. I think he did it with Carl. You know, I think yeah. he did it with Lori. So that makes total sense to me. So Rick has a little chat with JC um, and asks for a sign. Ironically, I think he does get one eventually. Yeah, and he... He makes a fatal mistake here. Any sign will do. Famous last words. Don't, don't, mm. No, there are several things that you just don't do. You don't go during a day where your work is empty of working and you say, wow, it's a quiet day. You don't say that, right? You don't make a wish to a genie while you're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Nah. <laughs> you don't do that. You don't say, any sign will do, because you will not like the sign you get. So uh, we're back to Andrea throwing shade at uh, Lori, and Lori is finally like, fine. I'm going to tell you that this was Rick's decision to make, and this is what he did. He decided to go to the CDC for these reasons. We had no idea what was happening. You need to shut up, and if you want the gun, take the gun. And Andrea kind of goes, and gives the gun back to Lori. (laughs) Because she realized that she was really 
kind of being a whiny baby. And Lori was actually probably the best one to have the gun. Right, exactly. Yeah. While there was a little bit of truth in what Andrea was saying, I just don't think that she needed to take it out on Lori because of no. something the guys were doing to her. Um, on top of the fact that you're probably going to think, well, Lainey, you you don't sound like you like Andrea very much. I want to preface this by saying I also don't really like Lori very much, but I think at this point they're both not on my like list. Andrea gets better. Lori, she kind of goes up and down with me, just not my favorite. Um, so if you're if you're saying, oh, well, are you going to like you know be like this about both of them through the whole thing? No, I am not. I just call it like I see it right now. <laughs> there, there are points for both of them, and we'll give them their points. But, right. Yeah. But here's another point. If you look, Glenn has the gator machete again. Oh, yes, he does. <sighs> All right. So we're going to get to the very last scene of this episode. Rick, Shane, and Carl happen upon a deer, a deer, and it's this most beautiful moment where they just see this living thing, this thing that's like natural and peaceful and Carl, the look on Carl's face is just pure joy at seeing this thing. And light is sparkling down through the dust that's settling. And then all of a sudden you see Carl get shot. This kind of gets me. And I know we're going to talk about this in a later episode as well because it kind of almost happens again. But in this case... The way that Carl gets shot is by being shot after the bullet already goes through a deer. Mm -hmm. A very muscular deer. And they explain it as saying, well, that's why he's still alive right now is because the bullet slowed down through the deer. Which I understand, but I also don't necessarily believe. And there's a few reasons why I don't believe it either. First, I want to bring up, when we talk about bullets, we keep on talking about the fact that they're made out of lead or something like that. They're not always made out of lead, but they're made out of a soft material and they're a soft metal mm -hmm. for a reason. When they hit, they deform. They spread out once they get inside you and they shatter. Which they did in Carl. They did in Carl. So this bullet should not have gone through that deer first off. And then gone deep enough in him to cause a really hard wound. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't. But even if it did, the wound that it would have caused him would have been so broad that he would have bled out. Right. Much worse. Second problem that I have with this. Why is this hunter shooting the body of the deer? Because it hits Carl in his, in his abdomen. Mm -hmm. So it hit low. Why is that hunter not shooting for the head? Yeah. Which is what you're supposed to do. To Which make a would clean, have missed Carl. It would have missed Carl completely. Mm -hmm. This guy was making a bad shot. And then somehow, almost miraculously, it goes through to hit Carl. Thankfully, though, we don't have anyone on the kill shot list for this week. Because nobody died. Nobody died that we saw. Right. Let's talk about the comics. Because there's actually some interesting things here. So a lot of what is happening right now in the comic part that I'm reading. Which is uh, chapter 2. Miles Behind Us. Which is page about 140 to 204 in the graphic novel. A lot of the things that happen in here happen all over season two in different places. So how it starts is they end up burying Shane because as we know, Shane is now dead in the comics. Dale reminds Rick that he warned him about Shane. I told you he was sleeping with your wife. Then the group sets off and they meet Tyrese, Julie, and Chris. Now this doesn't happen until season three. Tyrese is a very much loved character in this series, but he shows up there instead of in yeah. season three. Uh, then the group finds the Wiltshire Estates and they all move in. At this point, Dale and Andrea are totally together. Mm. Somebody actually walks in on them while they're together. Uh, so it's, a, it's this lady named Donna who is kind of a gossip. So she's starting to spread that around. Then there's a sign. Somebody, I think it's Rick, finds a sign on the outside of the... And maybe no one finds it. Maybe you just see it on the comic. Uh, but outside of Wiltshire Estates, there's a sign that says, All dead, do not enter. And there's snow over it. And then when the snow drops, you can see what it says. So they didn't see it when they walked in. But Wiltshire is overrun. So at some point after they've been there for just like 
not very long, maybe a couple hours, they all leave. And while they're out, Carl gets shot and they take him to the farm. So that is where it kind of matches up at the end of this episode that, yes, we're now going to move on to Herschel's farm. Mm. And that is the first episode of the second season. Uh, And next week, we're going to be talking about episode two, Bloodletting. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Lainey on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out.